This is coming in from Redding, California, Northern California, where they have been soaked. For decades, the Central Valley has been protected by levees standing dozens of feet high, water channels stretching hundreds of miles, and a system promoted as capable of controlling floods across the largest agricultural region in the United States. But in this footage, that system is beginning to fail. Water is no longer just spilling over roads. It is staying for weeks, for months. Thousands of homes are slipping into a condition where they are no longer fit to live in. Insurance refuses to pay. Property values collapse. Families are left trapped with mortgages on houses they cannot sell, cannot repair, and cannot safely occupy. This is no longer a single flood. This is land slowly becoming unlivable, right in the middle of California. The problem is that the Central Valley has been flooding for decades. The warnings were there. The solutions were built. Billions of dollars were spent. So why is this scenario still repeating today? And who decided that this was a price people could be expected to bear? The flood footage authorities said wouldn't happen. This footage was not supposed to exist in the year 2025. Water is sitting right at the edge of people's homes. Streets have turned into channels. Cars are stalling out in the middle of neighborhoods. And levee walls are so tall they block the view of entire blocks behind them. As if they were built not only to protect, but to remind people that the risk is still right next to them. In the Central Valley. Around the Tulare Lake Basin in the town of Corcoran. Residents recorded what they were told could not happen anymore. Not out in some remote river country, but right outside their front doors. In the places where they still pay taxes buy insurance, and trust the system was engineered to prevent this. On paper, this land was protected decades ago. The lake that once existed here was erased from the map. Rivers were rerouted. Levees were built. The ground was leveled for farming. Homes went up on what used to be a lake bed. But in the most recent rainy season, the water came back, not roaring in like a flash flood. It returned slowly, quietly, like it was following the memory of the land. This was not the kind of rain people are used to seeing on the weather report. It was not one big storm day and then it is over. It was a chain of atmospheric rivers, one after another. So the ground could not absorb anymore and the flood control system was pushed under sustained pressure it was never designed to carry. The impact was not just water on the road. Schools had to close. Roads were cut off. Cars could not get out of neighborhoods. Older families had to move belongings up high while not knowing whether the water would rise again overnight. Small disruptions, day after day, began to stack into a larger question. Why is this still happening? And this was not the first time. The Central Valley has lived through major floods before. Historic floods once turned the whole valley into an inland sea. After every one of those events, the promise sounded the same. The system would be improved, levees would be upgraded, and this would not happen again in the old way. Yet in this new footage, one detail makes people more uneasy than the damage itself. The water did not spill over the levee. It rose from inside. Geologic studies have been warning for years that the Central Valley has been sinking year by year because of long-term groundwater pumping. That means no matter how many times the levees are raised, the ground behind them is still dropping lower than the water those walls are meant to hold back. In Corcoran, the levee has been raised multiple times in less than a decade. Each raise means more dirt, more concrete, and tens of millions of dollars more in cost. But the land behind those walls keeps sinking, slowly and almost invisibly, until the water shows up. That is not what you hear in a weather segment. On television, people hear about risk levels, forecasts, and strong weather systems. In real life, residents see water sitting at their doorways day after day, not draining, not explained, and not paired with a clear answer for when anything will feel normal again. The frustration does not come from one moment of panic. It comes from a familiar feeling, the sense that this has happened before, the sense that after every flood, the only thing that changes is the water level. While the core questions are left behind, this footage does not capture a disaster that has fully exploded. It captures the moment people realize that despite technology, despite planning, and despite decades of reassurance, they are still living on land that can flood again at any time. And when they look at the flooded roads, the towering levee walls, and the quiet houses sitting behind them, many people start asking something that is no longer technical, but deeply personal. If this has happened before, if people were promised it would not happen again, and it is still happening in the year 2025. Then when the next round of rain arrives, is the water coming for your home too? Two, the valley that was always meant to flood. There is an uncomfortable truth that very few people are told directly when they watch flood footage from the Central Valley. This land is not a place that floods attack. 
It is a place that was chosen to carry water. Long before there were homes, schools, and highways, the Central Valley was a natural basin. Water from the surrounding mountain ranges flowed into it and stayed there. For centuries, that was how the system worked. And at the center of that basin once sat a massive body of water known as Tulare Lake. That lake did not disappear because nature changed. It disappeared because people decided this land would be used for something else. Water was diverted through canals. Rivers were rerouted. The lake was drained. The lake bed was turned into fertile farmland. For a long time, this model worked. Water was controlled. Production increased. Towns began to form directly on land that had once been open water. Over time, something important happened. The memory of flooding faded from everyday life. Later generations did not grow up with the idea that they were living on a natural buffer. On the map, it was simply land. On paper, it was property. In the minds of many, it was a safe place, a problem solved long ago. But the landscape does not forget what the map erased. When water volumes exceed the original assumptions, when rain no longer follows the old patterns, water does not need to find a new path. It only needs to return to this land's earlier role, a place that was once a lake, a place that once held water on behalf of other regions. This is where the story becomes difficult for many people to accept because it means that during extreme periods, the system is not asking whether flooding will happen. It is asking a different question. Where will the water go first? And history answered that question a long time ago. Areas that used to be lake beds, places that once served as natural buffers, are almost always the first to take the pressure. When the water comes back, it does not just cause temporary disruption. It stays long enough to remind everyone that this land's original purpose never truly disappeared. It was only covered by levees, canals, and technical promises. What frustrates many people is not that nature is following its own rules. It is that those rules were known in advance. Yet over time, they were treated as an inconvenience that could be postponed, rather than a limit that cannot be crossed. When floods happen, the story is often told as an accident. But to those who understand the history of the Central Valley, it looks more like a cycle than a one-time event, a cycle in which water is pushed away when possible and allowed to return when there are no other options. And within that cycle is something that is rarely said out loud. Some places are protected by letting other places flood. You do not need to name a specific decision or person to see this. You only need to look at old topographic maps and compare them with the areas hit hardest by modern floods. The pattern repeats in a troubling way. The communities living here did not choose to become sacrifice zones. They arrived after those decisions were made. They built homes on legally sold land. They pay taxes. They buy insurance. And they trust that past choices were fully resolved. But every time the water returns, that trust is tested. Because if a place was shaped by history to hold water, then no matter how many layers of protection are built, that role can be delayed. But it cannot be erased completely. And when residents see water spreading across fields, roads, and neighborhoods that were once called safe, an uneasy question begins to surface. It is no longer about weather. It is no longer about engineering. If this place was once chosen to flood, if that role never truly disappeared, then how many other communities are living on land meant to carry water? And they just have not had their turn yet. 3. When flooding turns homes into financial traps. There is a moment when, for many families in the Central Valley, everything begins to change. It is not when the rain is at its heaviest not when water first crosses the road. It is when they realize the water is not going away like it did before. In the early days, many people believe it is only a temporary inconvenience. A few roads closed, some trips postponed, furniture raised higher than usual. But as days pass and the water remains, the story stops being about weather. It becomes a story about life being put on hold. Footage filmed by residents shows front yards turning into shallow ponds, garages no longer usable, vehicles left behind, Older residents afraid to step outside because of the risk of slipping, because they do not know whether the water will rise again overnight. For them, every inch of water is not just a measurement. It is the line between safety and medical risk. When water stays long enough, costs begin to appear, not loudly, not all at once, but steadily, floors remain damp. Foundations take on pressure. Electrical systems and plumbing need to be checked again. Repairs that seem small at first start adding up into bills many families were not prepared for. And that is when insurance enters the picture. For many people, this is the biggest shock. Many policies do not cover flooding in the way they are experiencing it. Some claims are delayed, others never arrive. At the same time, insurance premiums for the following year rise, a quiet signal that the financial system now recognizes the risk, even as daily life has not yet recovered. For families living on fixed incomes, 
especially retirees. This is more than material loss. It erodes their sense of security. A home that once represented stability in later life becomes a constant source of worry. Every repair decision comes with the same question. Is it worth it? If this is going to happen again? In quiet conversations between neighbors, a new topic begins to surface more often. Not the weather, but the possibility of leaving. Should we sell? Would anyone even buy? What happens to property values if this area is marked as higher risk on insurance maps? These questions are not easy to answer because they reach deeper than money. They touch memory, community, and the feeling of belonging to a place. Many families have lived here for decades. Their children grew up here. They did not come because of risk. They came because this was once a place where a stable life could be built. But when flooding stops being a rare event and becomes a constant possibility, the way people see their homes begins to change. It is no longer just a place to live. It becomes a risky investment they are forced to carry without ever being asked. What is often missed is that most of this damage never appears in disaster summaries. It does not fit neatly into statistics. It lives in daily decisions. Should we repair? Should we buy more insurance? Should we stay one more rainy season? And when those decisions repeat often enough, a larger question starts to take shape. It is no longer geographic like the last section. It is no longer about warnings like the first. It is deeply personal and very real. If flooding here is no longer temporary, if costs keep rising and the value of the home keeps wearing down, then is staying still a reasonable choice or just the delay of a decision no one wants to make? Four, how repeated floods slowly tear communities apart. Flooding does more than damage homes. It changes how a community sees itself. After the water recedes, the clearest signs are not on the pavement. But in everyday life, some families do not return, others stay, but live cautiously, as if everything has become temporary. Homes that are quickly repaired stand next to others that remain empty, creating an uneven feeling that is hard to describe. In areas hit by repeated flooding, a quiet divide begins to form. Families with stronger financial resources can repair quickly, raise their homes, or leave temporarily when needed. Those without that flexibility become trapped. They cannot afford upgrades but they also cannot sell a property that is increasingly labeled high risk. This gap is not loud, but it is real. It is not the familiar divide between rich and poor. It is the divide between people who still have choices and people who no longer do. As flooding repeats, that distance grows, even among neighbors who once depended on each other. Community life begins to feel the strain. Schools adjust schedules. Small businesses stay closed longer than expected, then never reopen. When a familiar shop disappears, it takes more than jobs with it. It removes part of the neighborhood's rhythm. Gathering places grow quieter, and with them comes the sense that the community itself is shrinking. But the deepest change is in trust. Trust that the system is designed to protect people. Trust that after each flood, fixes will be made so it does not happen again. When flooding occurs often enough, that trust begins to wear away. Residents stop asking only about the weather. They begin asking why the same areas are always exposed first and why the same reassurances keep repeating while reality does not change. Community meetings grow more tense. Plans are presented, but fewer people believe they will solve the problem at its core. Instead, there is a growing sense that the community is being asked to accept a higher and higher level of risk as normal, rather than being protected from it. When that continues, flooding is no longer seen as a natural event. It becomes a social test, a test of which communities are protected first, which are asked to wait and which are slowly left behind. If one place is expected to carry risk so that another can remain safer, how long can that community endure before trust finally breaks? Five, why flood fixes keep failing the same places. After every major flood, the same pattern appears. Reports are released. Meetings are held. Emergency funding is allocated. On paper, it looks like the problem is being addressed. Then a few years pass and the water comes back. Most post-flood solutions focus on what broke, not on why the same places keep breaking. Levees are raised, channels are dredged, roads are repaired. These steps reduce immediate damage and create the impression that the system is responding as it should, but they do not change the land's basic role in the larger water system. This approach is easy to understand. It is fast, it is measurable, and it is reassuring. A higher levee is easier to accept than an uncomfortable discussion about whether development should continue in low-lying areas. Over time, this creates a familiar loop. Each flood is treated as a separate incident. Damage is repaired. Confidence is patched together, and the deeper questions are postponed again. Meanwhile, harder decisions remain delayed. 
Should more development be allowed in the areas that once served as natural buffers? Should risk maps based on older climate conditions be reconsidered? Should it be acknowledged that some places cannot be protected in the way people were promised? These questions are not only technical, they affect economic interests, tax revenue, and local livelihoods. When those stakes are high, the easiest choice is often to maintain the status quo, as long as repairs can be made quickly enough after each flood. For residents living with the risk, this feels very familiar. They see construction crews return, they hear the same reassurances, but they also know that none of it makes the next rainy season less worrying. For many, each repair simply buys more time living in a situation that is not sustainable. And so the loop continues, water arrives, damage follows, repairs are made, until the next extreme event appears and all the old questions return. At this point, many people no longer ask when the next flood will come. They ask something more uncomfortable, if solutions only ever patch the damage, if the core decisions are always delayed, how long will this cycle continue and who will be left living inside it? Six, the question California still refuses to answer. Looking back at everything that has happened, the most unsettling part is not the flood footage itself. It is how familiar it all feels. Rain falls, water rises, damage occurs, then the water recedes, infrastructure is repaired, reassurances are repeated, and life, more or less, goes on, at least until the next time. That cycle has become so familiar that many people no longer ask why it happens. They ask whether they can endure it again, whether this home is still worth repairing one more time, whether this community will still resemble what it once was after a few more rainy seasons. What makes this story uncomfortable is not that nature is changing. It is that society understands the limits of this land very well, yet continues to live right up against those limits. Year after year, the Central Valley is not alone in facing this question. Across the United States, there are communities living in managed risk zones, where safety is not a stable condition but a temporary agreement between people and the environment. And within those agreements, one truth is rarely stated clearly. Not all land is protected equally. Not all communities recover the same way. And not all promises are designed to last. When the water drains away and the news cycle moves on, the harder questions remain. Quiet, off camera, but present in everyday decisions. Stay or leave, repair or accept the loss. Trust the system or begin preparing for a different future. Perhaps the most important thing these images offer is not proof of a flood, but a reminder that there are places where nature never truly stepped aside, and there are decisions made long ago that still shape people's lives today. When the next rainy season arrives, the question is no longer how high the water will rise. It is a slower, heavier, harder question to avoid. How long will we keep patching our way through this risk before admitting that some places cannot be protected in the way we have been led to believe? Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.